Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Thursday, March 17th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, why have movies gotten so long recently? Plus, the startups working to develop lab-created chocolate and a nightmarish creature from Texas to rival all the hype around those giant Joro spiders. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. So I still have a tendency to think of movies as being 90 minutes long, even though that is so rarely the case anymore. Two hours, two and a half, three hours, three and a half? Looking at you, the Irishman. Why have movies gotten so much longer? Rebecca Rubin dug into this question recently for Variety, and an important thing that she reminds us is that movies used to be just as long, if not longer. Lawrence of Arabia and Ben-Hur did not just feel like they went on forever when you were a kid, they were both over three and a half hours long. Gone with the Wind, which came out in 1939, was just two minutes shy of four hours. Even in recent decades, there have occasionally been longer movies. I always remember that Titanic and The Right Stuff were super long, not because they necessarily felt too long, but because they came on two VHS tapes. You knew you were in for a long one when it came in one of those double boxes. And Rubin points out that most of the highest grossing films in history fall somewhere between two and three hours. But it does seem to be more of a rule these days as opposed to an exception, to push for longer and longer run times. The Batman is just under three hours. Dune, No Time to Die, Spider-Man, and The Eternals all sat right around two and a half hours. So what's going on? Quoting Rubin, In the early days of cinema, the duration of a movie directly correlated to the amount of film that was available. That's the reason in the first decade of the 20th century, most flicks would range from 10 to 15 minutes. By the 1920s, technology had advanced enough to accommodate feature-length films, and by the 1950s, running times for epics like Gone with the Wind or The Ten Commandments became a selling point, one that studios used to great effect to compete with television. Audiences could watch any old show at home, but only cinemas offered the kind of immersive immersive storytelling worth leaving the couch and parting with hard-earned cash. The deployment of digital cinema in the late 90s also allowed running times to vary. It freed filmmakers from the physical limitations of cumbersome film reels, and computerized versions of movies meant three-hour features didn't cost as much to ship and store." End quote. A longer runtime started being associated with quality and prestige because the movie had to use that length. It had to be good. It had to give audiences a reason to devote that much time to seeing a movie. And even though the technology was there, a longer movie was still a financial risk. A longer movie means fewer showtimes per day in theaters, so fewer tickets sold, and the harder it becomes to recoup the budget. And as budgets have ballooned as audiences crave big action and CGI, the balance has become even more precarious. Though, as Dana Polin, a cinema studies professor at NYU, points out, the movies that do unquestionably have the budget to spring on a longer movie, knowing that they'll make back the reduced showtimes and more, they can then start going buck wild, almost as if to flaunt the money with things like excessively long CGI action scenes. But there are other concerns too. You know, there is something to that magic 90 minute length that I cling on to. It's the perfect length for TV licensing. With commercials added in, it fits into a cozy two hour block. And there's more. Quoting again, A shorter movie is less expensive to put together, and therefore less of a financial risk. Such considerations start with the earliest physical part of a movie idea, the screenplay. A longer script requires more time to film. In turn, additional shooting dates tack on millions of dollars, and with a visual effects-driven film, an extra 30 to 60 more minutes of screen time can increase a budget by as much as 25%, one source at a major studio estimates. The more footage on tape, the more time is needed in post-production stages, which adds some $50,000 to $100,000 per week, the insider adds. That takes into account aspects like audio mixing and sound editing. It also requires more days to have actors on set. During the pandemic, longer filming schedules means a greater risk of having a COVID-19 outbreak delay production. Overall, trimming any excess before the cameras start rolling can be a difference of tens of millions of dollars. End quote. And paradoxically, sometimes a film can still seem to drag because the team ran out of time to make more precise edits. It can actually be cheaper and less time to just keep it all in. And I'll let you in on a little secret myself. 
on days when this podcast is extra long, sometimes it is because I genuinely got going on a topic and I am too excited to, in screenwriter speak, kill my darlings, but sometimes it's because I'm in a rush and taking the time to figure out what to cut down and still have it all make sense would take far longer. But for filmmakers who ended up with something too long and still have time to make edits, or perhaps a producer or studio is pushing the filmmakers to cut something, Ruben says that test screenings can be extremely helpful. Gauging the audience's reaction can help them decide what can stay and what can go. Of course, the big thing that has upended all of this is streaming. Original movies that go straight to streaming, like their TV show counterparts, can be any length the filmmakers want, because they don't have to worry about showtimes and ticket sales and TV licensing. That's how we get epic flicks like The Irishman and The Snyder Cut. And on the note of The Snyder Cut, Ruben spoke with John Turtletaub, the director of National Treasure, and he said that the first cut of the movie was 3 hours and 45 minutes. I need to see that. Three hours and 45 minutes of National Treasure? What even is in that movie? Can HBO Max please give us the turtle tob cuts? And Ruben doesn't get into this, but I do wonder if both the continuing success of original films coming from streaming platforms and more and more films being released in both theaters and streaming during the pandemic will contribute to this swelling of runtimes. Will even the movies that previously might have gone under the knife start keeping all the fluff? Are we entering an era of resurrected darlings? Knowing their audiences are able to pause at home to go to the bathroom and grab more snacks or might be checking their phone periodically, will filmmakers indulge in drawn-out scenes and ample backstories? Or will our shortened attention spans from always multitasking and pausing at home actually make audiences crave a return to shorter films? I mean, after all, how many times have you said you don't have time to watch a two-hour-long movie, but then end up watching four episodes of a half-hour TV show anyways? I love chocolate, but it is far from a sustainable or innocent industry. As an article in The Atlantic put it last month, quote, Cocoa is built on a fragile supply chain, the one that seems to be holding up for now. Most cocoa is grown in rainy equatorial countries in Africa and South and Central America, and climate change is already messing with crop yields. The global demand for chocolate keeps rising, so to keep up, farmers are clearing even more forests to grow cocoa. And while the average price for a single ton of cocoa is $2,600, most farmers do not earn a living wage, leading to reliance on child labor." End quote. And if you want to learn more about that, I recommend the documentary The Dark Side of Chocolate. It's 12 years old now, but unfortunately not too much has changed since it was made. Except for the rise of companies working to create chocolate in the lab. One startup, California Cultured, is taking a similar approach to alternative lab-created meats. Not plant-based alternatives, but rather ones that take the cells from living animals without killing them, and then grow those cells in the lab until they're ready to be turned into a consumer-ready meat. That is what California Cultured is doing with chocolate. Quoting again from The Atlantic, to make it, the scientists isolated individual cells from cacao plants and fed them nutrients. When the team had at least a couple hundred grams, it treated the mass like typical cocoa beans. The cells were fermented, roasted, and ground into chocolate. When added to cookies or candy, the end result tastes pretty close to the real deal, because, said Alan Perlstein, the company's CEO, most of cocoa's flavor comes from how beans are processed. End quote. Pearlstein says it will take about four years to make a chocolate bar up to his standards as a chocolate lover. It's also easier for them and others to make milk chocolate versus the comparatively more complex dark chocolate. But milk chocolates that aren't completely up to snuff could be used as components in mass-produced candy, where any imperfections would be harder to detect. At least in the U.S., where our standards are a bit lower than other nations. Here, a food item only needs 10% cocoa to be classified as chocolate by the Food and Drug Administration, versus a minimum of 20% in the European Union. And getting into that bulk chocolate market is exactly the ambition of sibling-run startup QOA, who ferments and roasts natural ingredients to create 100% cocoa-free chocolate. Once they get their recipe just right, they are hoping to sell their product for 20% less than real chocolate. 
Meanwhile, Penn State molecular biologist and cacao genetics expert Mark Giltonen is using CRISPR to try to create cacao varieties that are more disease-resistant so that the industry won't have to worry about low yields. He sees that as a more viable alternative than lab-created chocolates, but personally, my bigger concern is that that solution does nothing to address the child labor and other ethical violations on many farms. He does have a good point about what we might lose in lab-created chocolate, though. He told The Atlantic, quote, We only know the tip of the iceberg for flavor. We see thousands of molecules on the tiny tip of a cacao plant. It's mind-bogglingly complex, and we don't have the knowledge to reproduce that and make it taste good. End quote. And that is a big question for me. You know, I feel like we're constantly hearing about new benefits from cacao. It's been used for so many different things over the millennia. Could a lab-grown chocolate really account for and provide all those same potential benefits? You know, on this show, I've covered so many different types of lab-created foods that are being worked on. Steak, dairy milks, entire meals in one square-shaped pod. It's definitely a growing sector, and mostly for good reason. You know, we're concerned about sustainability and animals and our own health. But if we ever got to the point where the majority of our food was created in a lab, you know, coffee without beans, peanut butter without peanuts, and honey without bees, all real products that there are startups working on, according to The Atlantic, what might we be losing? You know, maybe it's just like what people said when they started being able to eat produce that wasn't in season where they lived. But I worry about the idea that food would become so uniform across different environments and that maybe you'd lose a little of that joy and sense of adventure and getting to try new things in new places. But at least for some beloved foods that might be in danger, I mean, I'll definitely take a lab-created chocolate over nothing. Recently, everyone was up in arms about the Japanese Joro spiders that are expected to extend their range all along the eastern seaboard of North America this year. The bright yellow spiders can grow quite large, and a ballooning technique used by baby Joros was exaggerated to make it sound like the giant adults would be dropping ominously from the sky. Most of that was puffed up, and the Joros are basically harmless to humans. Nonetheless, all of the Texas media that I follow saw the Joro spider hype and said, hold my beer. Texas would like to remind you that they are the Australia of the U.S. when it comes to massively large and weird creatures. Growing up there, it was routine to encounter armadillos in the backyard, geckos in the kitchen, scorpions and rattlesnakes on the trails, and sometimes even a coyote or javelina. All of our insects, from flies to wasps to cockroaches, seem to be much bigger than their northern counterparts. And, of course, you gotta watch out for the chupacabras. And then there's the giant red-headed centipede. These centipedes are about half a foot long, but can grow up to 9 or even 12 inches, making them the biggest centipedes in North America. They're black, with about 46 bright yellow legs and that trademark red-orange head. They're also venomous, but not fatal to humans, despite what the legends say. You'll feel a sharp sting and experience some swelling, maybe some nausea and lightheadedness. They don't actually like human flesh, so they'll only bite you if you scare or annoy them. In better news, even though they might hurt you and look friggin' horrifying, they're really good at gobbling up other pests. Though I guess you could fall on either side of that for which pest you'd rather have around. According to TexasHillCountry.com, the giant red-headed centipedes feed on lizards, toads, snakes, and sometimes even birds and rodents. And if you want to see the giant red-headed centipede in all its nightmarish action, I put a National Geographic video link in the show notes. Well, if all goes well, NASA at long last is supposed to be loading the SLS onto Launch Pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida later this afternoon. The mega rocket will wait there for a couple of weeks before undergoing, on April 3rd, most of the same procedures that it would for a normal launch, but will stop just before ignition. That exercise, called a wet dress, is a critical test to figure out any final tweaks that need to be made ahead of the SLS's hopeful debut launch this summer. The SLS has been chronically delayed at almost every step of production, though, so I never have a lot of confidence in the timeline, but we are edging ever closer to that first flight. 
But that is it from me for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotke.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.